Good morning. Hello, everyone. Now, what you've just been hearing as you walk into the PAC are pollinators. And that's the subject of my lecture today from Biology Enrichment Week. This is a collective sound of pollinators, and mostly that of Apis mellifera, the honeybee. And it's working a field of dandelions, which are quite likely to be, for this particular set of Apis mellifera, the collection of early, a pollen from early spring flowers. So what is the honeybee? That's what we're going to explore today, so that I can then share with you what essentially is a critique or maybe a reflection on how we keep bees. So... Although many of us have cringed whenever we've seen a black and yellow stripey thing flying in front of us at some stage, and, and I'm sure we all have done that, those insects there are very, very important and have an enormous role in our lives. And so let's get to know what these honeybees are. Let's explore the classification and the morphology of these bees. So here... The, the taxon, taxonomic classification of honeybee is quite extensive, as with any other organism on Earth. So we have what I will refer to most of the time is apis. That's, the honeybee is part of that genus. And there are seven species of the apis genus. And so... There are six, and there are, of those seven species, there are six subspecies of the Apis sirena. That is the, mo that is the honeybee that's mostly found within this part of the world, and especially on Jeju. And we've got four subspecies of Apis dorsata, which can be found in India, Laos, and the Philippines. And then there are 29 subspecies of Apis mellifera. And that actually can be attributed to being most evasive of all the honeybees, if that could be actually a contradictory term. I guess that's how some of us would see it. And so the classification of the honeybee began with Carlos Linnaeus in 1758. And that is the British black bee, Apis mellifera mellifera. Now, not many of you will have seen that, and not many people in the UK have seen it either but they do feel that it still exists. The most recent classification of Apis mellifera happened in 2011, 10 years ago, and they found a bee on the highlands of Ethiopia, and, and they've named that, classified it as Apis mellifera semensis. So it's a recent thing. Not everyone knows everything about honeybees. So what are the characteristics of honeybees? Well, in this immense photo, you'll be able to see that the eyes are hairy. The mandibles of this worker, they lack teeth. 
and carnei, so they don't chew anything. The legs have got claws. I'm going to have to leave this photo. This is one of my favorite ones. The legs have got claws, and you'll be able to see those very, very carefully if you observe it at the base of the legs of this particular Apis mellifera. And the hind legs, they have corbicula, which is like a bag which they can stuff in pollen or collect resin. And each bit honeybee has a particular role. And that role determines whether they collect pollen in those bags or whether they collect resin. And the wings have complete venation. Okay? So all these characteristics come together to be able to maximize their foraging capacity and their collection of pollen, resins, and nectar. So we can appreciate that honeybees are kept. We have kept them for millennia. So the rewards of doing so must have been significantly great, otherwise we wouldn't have persevered for so long. Here, this particular cave drawing is in Valencia, Spain. It's still not determined as to how old it is. There's theories between 8,000 to 20,000 years old in this cave. So I'll let you think about that. It does follow that the meaning of the word keep is evocative of a practice which is significant. And in modern times, it has changed. And that's what it should look like, or that is an interpretation of what that cave drawing in the Cave of Spiders in Valencia, Spain looks like. Now, there was one person that I've got to know who is interested in the ethnography of how honeybees have been kept by humans across the globe. Now, you can pick the photographer, can't you, really? He's the one in the high um, safety suit with lots of guidance ropes and everything else like that, holding the bag tentatively with some pygmies from Somalia. Now, they, as you know, do not have any safety ropes whatsoever. The photos I'm going to show you are Eric's. His name's Eric Tunering. Now, here in Cameroon, where there are plenty and plenty of flowers within this particular, um, res what they call the water reservoir of Cameroon, there are many flowering trees as big as dinner plates. And so there's no pesticides used either in that area. So these young people have left the cities because of unemployment and have moved to the rural areas of Cameroon. And so here, they collect honey as well to be able to support their family's existence. And so what they're doing at the moment is not some sort of tribal sort of uh, ritual or anything at this stage, or cultural one for that matter, but they're simply wrapping themselves up in some sort of brush forage to be able to slow down the persistence of the honeybee protecting their hive. So they climb these trees, immense heights. I'm sure none of us would even try to do this. They gather the honey and they bring it down. Can you imagine the reward of being able to do something so trepidatious and you end up with something so rich and sweet? It's worth it. Here in Russia, there are uh, there are beekeeping practices that still um, are similar to that that was um, prevalent within the Baltic countries during the Middle Eastern um, time. Middle uh, sorry, Middle Eastern times, Middle Ages times, early to late Middle Ages, and such was the demand of beeswax during the Middle Ages. For example, in 14th century England, the 9,000 churches that were um, in existence during that time, used one-fifth of the beeswax that was produced in those Baltic countries. The rest of that beeswax demand for religious observances was used from local um, beekeepers, and that must have meant that they kept hundreds of thousands of small boxes of bees to be able to supplement that four-fifths of demand. It still goes on. Here in the uh, in southeast of France, another ancient beekeeping technique: sawn off chestnut trees, hollowed out, and bees are kept inside of them. 
It's not unusual to still find this practice in southeastern France. So once COVID is lifted, have the chance to go out into France and see if you can find these places in the southeast of France. They're kept secret because people want to look after them. Then we've got, it's not so unusual to find urban beekeeping here on the Paris Opera House and the not so famous, a Parisian lawyer's office with a bees in his office. Someone's rooftop, well, this is not just someone's, this is Fortnum and Mason's rooftop with bees there. It could be their, their own private apiary, or it could be their cottage garden or their potagerie, all of which represent the amateur topology of beekeeping and keeping bees. And then there are the professionals. Here in Argentina, we have got the boatman of the uh, Parana Delta, one of the largest deltas in the world, 340 kilometers long, 60 kilometers wide. And what they do is they push further into the delta due to soya farm, for farming, which is taking over most of that agricultural land or that possible land that the cate plant used to inhabit. And so what they do is they just keep going, pushing in further and further, offloading their boxes of bees onto stilts so that their bees can forage that cate plant. In Romania, we have migrant beekeepers, and they keep moving around from crop to crop. Their transport is not water, but wheels. And so they are following sunflower fields, as well as the acacia trees and wildflower meadows. So I hope from these photos you begin to appreciate the choices among many in where, how people keep bees. So resulting in professionals, amateurs, small and large, and also families but I'd like us to reflect on this next photo. It looks like a really poor photo, doesn't it? It's heavily pixelated. All those pixels you see there, they're bees. Millions of bees released from those boxes on the back of that semi-trailer. I call it a semi-trailer, or a truck. Now, these bees have been transported 1,200 kilometers, maybe even 1,500 kilometers from the eastern states of United States America to the western state, California. Such distances take three to four days. These bees are not allowed out. They have to stay trapped inside their boxes while traveling. And so all of this traveling is to make possible the 11 billion, or perhaps more now, the 11 billion U.S. almond crop. Such crop represents half of the billion dollar crop, U.S. food crop industry. And all of this is made possible by pollinators, in particular, Apis mellifera, only those. So in the process of transportation, being shut in for three to four days, these bees die and if they don't die, they are seriously compromised in terms of health, immune system, and their ability to locate their own hives, their own queen. So although that looks very scenic, and it's a lovely little shot, okay, the U.S. almond groves have increased in, um, in, in, in acreage, in old terms, but in, in surface area, increased to more than 4,000 square kilometers. This is 4% of Jeju, six times the area of Seoul, and it's growing. So why is it such a large market? It's because of the fact that in the US alone, I'm not even considering the global perspective here, the US milk, almond milk sales have increased since 2018 by 250%. So that's four times greater than any other plant-based milk. And to meet that demand, 30 million honeybees are packaged up as an agricultural commodity supporting a familiar farming strategy to provide pollination services. And by doing so, that practice relies uh, sorry, that practice removes any reliance on native bees and pollinators in that surrounding ecosystem. It's a neat package, don't you think? It's almost like 
McDonald's in a pollination, McDonald's pollination in a box, or be Amazon, something along those lines. Now this quote, the bee is domesticated but not tamed, is by a man who is no longer with us, sadly, but at least some of us will get to know who he is now, William Longwood. Now William Longwood was a journalist and a Pulitzer Prize winner and he wrote a very controversial book in 1960s called Poisons in Your Food, which then, 60 years ago, challenged okay, the food industry and the agricultural industry, and it's still a contentious topic now. He directed people's attention to the increased accumulation of pesticides in the food chain, and he was not thanked for doing so. And so Rachel Carlson, I'm going to leave that name with you to think about later on, and the majority of the science commu scientific community at the time held his work in high, uh, high esteem, but it brought him into considerable conflict with the US agricultural government agencies. So now 60 years later, the same poisons have accumulated, and not just in the top consumers of the food chain, but in the producers, all the plants, in the angiosperms, in their floral network, in their uh, nectar and in their pollen. So the honeybee is no longer domesticated it's dying. This site is not unusual. Sometimes you get to see the, the mass death of bees, if you're lucky. Sometimes you don't. They just don't come back to the hive. And so they're disappearing or they're dying. And it's due to the complications of parasites, pesticides, and poor nutrition. So in this picture, let me show you what a parasite looks like for the bee. This is the most significant parasite. It's called Varroa destructor, and it lives up to its name. It is a... You can see here, there's one parasite sucking off... It's, it's actually biting through the leg of the bee, and the other one is on the top, just inside from the wings. It's actually hitching a ride with the bee. And so one of the other secondary impacts, so that's a primary uh, impact, that it compromises its health, reduces its immune system, and also weakens it in terms of its metabolic activity. But the other secondary um, consequence is deformed wing virus. And so they're prone to that while they are in pupation. And when they emerge, ready to fly, ready to forage, they can't. So they are ejected from the hive. And, you know, bees are quite ruthless. If you can't function in a social um, community, you're out. So this bee would be out. And it's not the only one in a, in a colony. There would be hundreds of them. So where Lo William Longwood, uh, Longwood and Rachel Carlson once stood alone, you know, seeing the interconnection of species within a habitat, over the past 20 years, scientists such as Professor Geraldine Wright at Oxford Uni now direct their attention to exploring the impact of this disrupted connection. Professor Geraldine Wright is not only an entomologist at Oxford's Department of Zoology, but she's also a professor of comparative physiology and organismal biology. She does a lot of things, and let me show you what she sort of does. Now, in her lab, her research scientists and her postgrads, they specifically investigate the nutrition and the psychology of bees. And they use an approach at these four levels. Now, nutrition and psychology are very, very important when it comes to honeybees. And so it's known that honeybees can associate the floral nectar to floral scent. They can then learn to find that floral scent. They can also learn to forage on that same species so as to maximise the efficiency of that food collection. And then they can also do the maths they can also determine the ratio of compounds in that floral nectar to justify going back to that plant species again and again. And they also learn how to avoid certain odours, okay? So they, um, because some of those odours will be toxins. So what they do is they line up their little bees, and these are all little bees in these little black little chairs, 
And what they've done in one of the many papers that she has published, they expose these bees to pesticides over 48 hours. And they then give them a differential learning task. Don't forget, I said we're looking at bee psychology and of uh, olfactory rewards and punishments. And they're looking to see whether the bees can actually make, dis make decisions based on the floral scent that was offered after being subjected to neonicotinoids. And so the punishment is quinine. Not many of you would know what quinine's like, but it's quite bitter. And it will stop a bee from poking out its tongue, which is what you can see there between the, an the antennae, poking its tongue out to be able to receive that reward. Now, if it wasn't to get the reward, it would retract its tongue back in because it would be able to smell, that's the olfactory sense, be able to smell the quinine and retract its tongue straight away. So it reacts, it's made a decision. So what Professor Wright and her co-authors found was that when exposed to these four different neonicotinoids, they found that one of them totally, totally confused the bee's decision-making process. And it's the top left one, thymethoximum. And that one, and you can see there the red line with the squares and the dashed red line, okay, with the triangle, that is the reward and the punishment. The bees could not differentiate between either one of them. And yet the control is significantly different on each of the other graphs, which is the gray line with the gray, with the, um, gray square. Significantly different. With the other three, the honeybees eventually learnt how to, um, you know, like respond to rewards and punishment, but it took them a considerably long time. So what this means is neonicotinoids stop bees from foraging. It encourages them to actually make bad decisions. The agonistic behaviour of neonicotinoids disrupts the cholinergic signalling process and the neurotransmission in the bees. So in other words, bees will go out there once exposed to going in, say, an almond crop or a sunflower crop or any of those essential crops that need pollinators. And when exposed to neonicotinoids, they may never come back because they would be disorientated. They may actually pick up toxins instead of the floral nectar. They may even re not even recognize what their queen smells like anymore and not be able to come back. And yes, the queen does give off a scent. That's what brings those bees back to their own colony and not anyone else's colony. And so it, this has a significant negative effect on their long-term survival. And so this data that Professor Wright and her co-authors have put together and published could actually help us reconsider how and where we keep bees. So my question is, should our drive for more commodities put our precious and indeed essential ally, the Apis genus, into a situation of being continuously poisoned and left to die? So we've come to the end of it. So when you leave the PAC after your first lesson for the day, Reconsider that little black and yellow striped buzzy insect. You'll see them here and there. You'll see them now. They're still foraging. And they will to the end of October here on Jeju. Give it room to move. Don't flap your arms about. Don't scream at it. Don't do anything along those lines. Let it forage. Wish it a good life because it's actually helping you with yours. Thank you. <laughs>